So our uh, second presentation is uh, titled From Confocal Microscopy to Molecular Imagineering. Um, when I saw the word you know, imagineering, I was not sure whether it's in a typo or I'm misreading it. But definitely, it's, um, you know, Dr. Ma Mike Norton is going to explain what it is. Um, so I have a brief you know, introduction to Dr. Mike Norton. He received his PhD in solid state chemistry from Arizona State University in 1982, working in the area of two-dimensional antiferromagnetic materials as a National Research Council postdoctoral fellow from 1982 to 1984. He worked in the area of superconducting oxide materials at the Naval Weapons Center in China Lake, California. As an assistant professor at the University of Georgia, he developed methods for electrochemical growth of superconducting oxide super lattices. In his career at Marshall, his studies have focused on soft matter structures, including DNA-based nanostructures with the emphasis on the fabrication and characterization of electro-optical nanoarchitectures for sensing applications. Dr. Norton is co-director of the Molecular and Bio Bio Biological Imaging Center located in the Biotechnology Building on Marshall Main Campus. Dr. Norton is a co-founder of two companies. One company is um, Vandalia Research, which produces large quantities of custom DNA for industrial research and educational purposes. The company has laboratories in downtown Huntington. The second company is um, Parabon Nanolabs, which applies DNA nanotechnology to address challenges in the health and homeland security areas. He is also a co-inventor of the technology central to a third company, which manufactures light emitting solid state lamps. Uh, we are very privileged to have Dr. Norton speak to us. Here is uh, Dr. Norton. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about our research and how, I hope, we've integrated together this uh, high performance computing, the wonderful facilities that have been availed to us really recently with our work at, uh, in nanotechnology. It's great that uh, Joan like perfectly introduced you to DNA because there's a lot to DNA and I hope that we'll show actually another facet to DNA, almost turning uh, upside down uh, the utilization for DNA. So I start out suggesting uh, we'll talk about big little things, so microscopy, and then we're going to go so small in scale that you can only see it with your imagination. Uh, that's why I've got this imagineering, and by the way, Disney did not invent imagineering, but uh, the idea is bringing things that you can imagine into reality, but what if that reality is so small that you can only see it on a computer, and, and that's where I'm going to kind of end the talk. There are things that are really, really small. So for the overview, I'd like to begin talking about uh, some microscopy and, and because we're an educational institution and we have students and we have classes, so have we integrated this uh, wonderful vis lab or visualization capability? I'd like uh, to kind of begin by discussing that. So our imaging laboratory and I'd like to uh, invite you to uh, visit it. Uh, in this room we have our newest uh, microscope, a $930,000 microscope, which you could say, well that must be quite a microscope. It must do wonderful things and, and, it, and that's true. But when you look at it, this is the monitor, this little bitty monitor. So you'd like spend a million dollars to find out something and then you're only going to be able to see it in a uh, this on uh, one little location. So if, if it's so expensive, it must do some really interesting things. And, and there are two interesting things that this microscope can do. And one of them is it can take images really rapidly, three-dimensional images really rapidly. And uh, the, the value is life doesn't stay still. Your cells don't stay still. You want to be able to grab that information really fast. So. That's, that's part of its story. The other part of its story is how does it achieve this ability to get three-dimensional images better than a microscope that uh, we may have had uh, five years ago. And this uh, particular little demonstration uh, highlights well the difference between old technology and the new technology. And this is about a half a million dollars of the microscope is this newer technology to have a laser that fires on the order of 100 times 10 to the minus 15 seconds is the length of the fire. So that's just a decimal place with 13 zeros after it and then a one. That's how long it takes for this flash of light to go on. So it's, it's, it's relatively fast. That's a, a lot of zeros. 
So here you see the old technology focuses the light, but you can see the light here, so it's like a flashlight. You shine a flashlight on something, and sure, you can see it, but you're seeing all the parts of the thing that you're looking at. If uh, you have this new kind of a flashlight, this very fast flashlight, then I, I hope you can see this little bitty point of light. So that's a point of light that actually the solution, or as we'll suggest the cell, has created this little bit of light floating in the middle of whatever happens to be your sample. And for most of our cases, that sample is a cell. So we have this little piece of light that we can move inside of the cell from one place to another, three-dimensionally inside the cell, and we can look at any part of the cell that we would like to see. You've got to use your imagination to see what this new facility, I, I was trying to think, uh, the, the best way that I can express how wonderful this technology is, is that there's no way I could do it justice on the screen. But I, I would like to drive you through a little bit of the way that I view it, and actually tonight you can kind of uh, view it. Josh Titlow is going to be presenting, not single cell work, but close to single cell work, and uh, I, I kind of should have given Dr. Antonson the credit that uh, this microscope, we don't know that you'll be able to see a crawfish making a memory, but it's pretty close to that. Like making a thought, see that in real time. There's not that many other opportunities to be able to do that. And uh, we'll be at it. So this is the part that <laughs> rather than look at a screen, I don't know about closing your eyes, but imagine that this thing like a flying saucer, which, you know, cells do kind of look like uh, fried eggs that it lands here, but it doesn't, it lands actually in the room and you're all embedded inside of that flying saucer. And there's as many things flying around inside of that like egg thing as in a Kroger. So you just go to Kroger, you say, they've got about 50,000 different things, but you go to the baby food aisle, they've got a lot of copies of that. And that's what a cell is, right? Cell is really very busy like location. And so why would you want to show that like uh, on, on a single screen. It's a three-dimensional object. We believe it's best displayed as three dimensions, and this facility absolutely enables us to do that, uh, and, and you'll be able to see that uh, this evening. So I was thinking, uh, how can we reduce this problem from two dimensions to two dimensions? So this is an image of a cell. It's a pretty good image of the cell. It's a two-dimensional image, and uh, in a normal cell, we would take 30 different layers throughout that cell, and then we'd actually be able to see that in the 3D viz, but you can't see that, you only see 2D. So I said, what's the simile? Just cut down the image so that you only see 3% of it, and that's how much you're seeing if you just see the two-dimensional representation. So here we have about 3% of this image. So if you can tell me, oh yeah, that's all I need to see, I can tell you what's over here by just seeing 3%, and that's where we would be if we didn't have this Viz Lab, this capability to see in 3D. So it, it's really wonderful. Next, I'm going to like change to my research, because this is other people's research in the Molecular and Biological Imaging Laboratory. We do support other people's research, and I really do sincerely invite you to visit the laboratory to see what we're doing, to see what resources we have that you could share with students, too. It would be really wonderful not only to tour them, but uh, there's actually ex experiments they could perform also. In our research, and we're uh, funded by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency for the most part, so that's the Army, and uh, they have to be concerned about soldiers. So uh, this uh, slide kind of overuse what they viewed uh, about 15 years ago as being the future, and it's still the future, and that's the way things go, that it takes a long time to create the future that uh, they would like for a person out in the field to have a computer that's kind of small. This 10 microns is about one-tenth of a hair across, and that's not the incredible part because they can do that. So you want a personal computer that's about a tenth of the diameter of a hair. They've already made those, and they've like thrown them over communities for monitoring them, things like that. But. Uh, so it's nice to have a computer, but if a computer is going to be that small, it should be able to talk to you. But also, and Selby Wellman brought this up, you would like to be able to sense, and you'd like to be able to sense molecules would be a great thing to be able to do. Uh, unfortunately, even though Motorola was involved and Sandia, they were not able to bring down the next step where a component, a sensor, was on the order of one nanometer in size. So that's a single molecule sensing molecules, and a lot of people believe that's a sensible way to to do things, but uh, these molecules are really small, 
there's not good microscopy for them, so it brings back up this computer infrastructure that if you want to see these molecules, you want to see how they behave, you're never going to do it, even with the most wonderful microscopes, unless you consider the computer to be the microscope, and, and that's pretty much where we are. So, we'll, so this is uh, an example of an advertisement from Toshiba where they were suggesting this is a human finger and that's a computer. It's not a computer chip, it's a computer. You can get a keyboard to talk to that thing. That's a real computer, but that's old history. That's from five years ago. <laughs> so to do assembly, this is a cell or an image of a cell taken with an atomic force microscope, and this is the size of about 100 of the chips that we are working on. We're working on chips, material, that are made out of DNA. Maybe not entirely out of DNA, but they're starting material of DNA. And I'll be explaining kind of the difference between genomic DNA and the kind of DNA that we work with. Although we do work with the genome of a virus, uh, it's a kind of a nice handy size uh, piece of material. So you use something called a atomic force microscope that just uh, rocks across the surface and whenever it like hits something tall, it like bends up and then our image is gonna be brighter if something's high, if something's low, the image is going to be dark because I'll be showing a couple of images taken with atomic force microscope. So it has a tip that may or may not be sharp as a component of it, and that's going to mean that our microscopy, how small we can look at things, is going to depend upon how sharp this part is, which they're not very sharp at all. So this, uh, I don't know if turning down lights a little bit would be good. It, it, it's going to be fine. You could perhaps misidentify this as being two strands of DNA that are really, really close to each other, but about 15 years ago, someone said, I can make objects out of DNA. I don't have to use DNA to code for life. I can actually code for real physical objects using DNA. So this uh, bottom one, bottom image a little bit clarifies the idea that there's five different DNA molecules involved. They're, they look like they're side by side, but they're intertwined with each other, and actually the technical term isn't intertwined, they cross over. So one piece of DNA that thinks that it's part of one of those normal double helical strands, it like switches over and now it's part of this other double helical strand. So this is uh, about 15 years ago, Ned Seaman came out with the idea that you can make small tiles out of DNA and you can build objects. Well, things have changed in 15 years, like in everything else. And now there's a, a technique called origami. And uh, nicely enough, or you can imagine where they get that term origami, it means we're gonna be folding molecules into shapes, single molecules, fold them into whatever kind of shape we would like. So on this side, uh, we have the idea you get a single strand piece of DNA and a bunch of little bitty pieces of DNA, you put them together and a miracle happens and you end up with a smiley face that was kind of like pretty popular a uh, number of years ago. Uh, we do a similar thing, but instead of making a smiley face, we make this thing that we might call a chip. It's about uh, 197 nanometers across, 72 nanometers tall, and it's got a window in it that's about 22 nanometers, which these are really small dimensions, and all this work has to do with working with single molecules, that the idea is to eventually make something that's gonna cost an incredibly small amount of money, maybe be very fast, and be able to communicate, because people have already made the equivalent of RFID with single molecules, so uh, a lot of the things that Selby talked about uh, we're going to be seeing those things, but just really magnified. This uh, image I don't think you can see at all, maybe on the side screens, but uh, there's a, an image of one of those uh, single molecules here that actually when it gets all folded up, it gets really tightly bunched that it's just uh, one of these little objects. And these are some examples of this object, whereas this is just a drawing of it, this is actually what we can see by using atomic force microscopy. To uh, be able to know what sequences we want to use, a supercomputer is pretty helpful because we don't want to repeat the use of any sequence. So I work with a group called Parabon Nanolabs, and they can make out a sequence that is not going to bind to any of the other 14,000 different locations that are inside of one of these things that we might call a DNA chip. So you can do that by hand. <laughs> there are some really horrible programs that you can use to almost do them pseudo-mechanically, but doing it by supercomputer is a much uh, better approach. So this uh, just shows a reproduction of uh, what uh, this uh, 
chip system might look like with uh, two locations that are able to bind other molecules because although DNA is a good thing to use as a, a structural material, kind of like concrete or wood or something like that, we do want to consider uh, we're going to need to use other molecules. And usually we're going to find that biology has beaten us to many of the targets we would like to get to. Many of the things that we would like to accomplish, nature working in its own laboratory for a really long time, it's got a pretty good solution that maybe we can beat that solution, but maybe we had better incorporate that solution. And later I'll get into how the supercomputation will enable us to, I shouldn't say exactly hijack nature's technology, but uh, nature's technology doesn't always agree exactly with what uh, humans might like to accomplish. So this is uh, the idea that we can get those chips and we can strand them together. And this is the idea that we can get uh, molecules that uh, can attach to these two locations. So we see two streptavidins that are just nature's linkers uh, that we've been able to incorporate into these uh, simplified chips. If we can make a bunch of these uh, chips strung together, then maybe we can also make them so that we have these uh, streptavidin molecules inside of these window locations. And this will enable us to deposit or to uh, address whatever molecule we would like into one location as shown on this chip, or in principle 250 different locations on something that's one third of the wavelength of normal visible light. So these are really small uh, chips. This is an example where we have addressed uh, a green fluorescent protein. So this is a structure for green fluorescent protein. We decided that there were two locations that we would like to address those molecules or make them go to. And this involves something called self-assembly, that the system has to assemble itself because no one has fingers so small that they can place these molecules where they want to. And even if you did have little fingers, because that a time force microscope may be at a pretend to be fingers in, in some uh, ways. Do you have enough time to place all these molecules one at a time, or do you want it to be a parallel process so that all these molecules do what they're supposed to do simultaneously? So this uh, self-assembly requires that we design a system that will bind them. So we've got uh, this molecule has a component that likes to plug into this component if it's bound by a nickel ion as a linker. Uh, so that's one technology that we've been able to publish as a method to put one kind of molecule on a surface because you do want something called orthogonality. If you can, just like all of our, to, to address something to your house, you need a different number for your house. In some way, we need a different number for every kind of molecule that we would like to address to the surface of a chip, which does make things kind of uh, complex chemically. So uh, very recently, we've uh, put uh, this streptavidin on the surface of these chips with the idea we would like to make a sensor for ricin. Ricin is uh, one of the most toxic molecules that we know of. It's not on the number one list, but it is on the number two list for the uh, uh, defense agencies as being a threat because one molecule can destroy 50 other molecules per second. One molecule can destroy a cell and although we've got plenty of cells, some of those cells we wouldn't like to lose very, very much at all. So uh, to, to make a detector out of this system, we would have to attach an antibody to it. So of course we'd like to put on the uh, streptavidin as the intermediate part of a linker. And then we have been able to put uh, antibodies onto the uh, surface of these species. And the fact that it's not very well resolved, that has something to do with the fact that the microscope can't see these very small things that we're trying to produce, even though Marshall has wonderful microscopy capabilities. I'm not suggesting that we could like fly these samples to somewhere else they could take better images. I'm almost suggesting imaging has its limits. At a small scale, imaging becomes not the tool that we would like to think it could be. Uh, our, our, our close to the last application, or our last application we, we could suggest, well this you could actually see with some kind of a microscope, is uh, a polymerase. And uh, Joan discussed uh, the, the concept of being able to sequence very rapidly. That sequencing relies on polymerase. Polymerase is just a molecule that uh, makes 
other molecules. In some cases, it makes other molecules of DNA. In this particular case, it makes other molecules of uh, RNA. And this will be part of the, tonight's demonstration, too, of uh, just being able to visualize the structure for uh, this species of polymerase. We have down here these uh, ripples are this polymerase is running a piece of DNA through it, and every time it runs through it, it gives us a signal. Now, that might not sound that great, and technologically, you could ask, what's the use of that? But it's not very far removed from a system that in real time would be able to sequence your genome in three minutes. Those calculations are kind of easy to do. Three minutes for under $100. Now, I'm not saying that the evolution to that system is really easy to do. But the idea that you could have sequences perform full human genome from a really limited number of molecules, non-amplified, because we're discussing single molecule work, it uh, could be considered amazing, but we know we've got only 10 years. Someone's going to do this very fast, very inexpensive sequencing. Uh, we'd like to be in the race, so to speak. So this, uh, this shows what's called a ribbon structure for this uh, RNA polymerase. It's another one of the visualization assistances that uh, we've been able to get out of the Viz Lab. And this is another case where you could close your eyes, you could use your imagination, because it should be that these images are pretty useless to you, that there's so much information and it's compressed down to only two dimensions. How can you make sense? out of uh, an image like this. So this does show many of the components of one molecule. All, all this stuff that looks like ribbons or confetti, those are simplified versions of what the, the atomistic disposition is inside of the molecule. And you just can't make sense of it by looking at a two-dimensional image of it. Three dimensions, and I think at 5 o'clock or so, they're going to be demonstrated. That you, you can tell, you can really see the value for having a three-dimensional uh, visualization of a system. And our uh, last project that we're working on is to make that sensing molecule, the molecule that's going to interact with another molecule and give us a signal. And when it interacts, what it might do is it might bend. And we would wonder, what's going to happen if you bend a molecule? How are you going to get in the laboratory and you're going to bend a molecule, a single molecule, and then you're going to tell what's going to happen? Maybe you need to go to the computer is the most wonderful kind of a microscope for that because you can certainly grow this molecule inside the computer. And we have a couple of different visualizations of modifications of these molecules. And I know this is like, do you really want to know about molecules? But we're hoping <laughs> this, this will be of some value to you when you're in an airport or in a city or in a building uh, to know what kind of molecules you're breathing because that could be important for you. So this, uh, this red and blue parts, those show where electrons are, particularly inside of a molecule. And there's not a microscope in the world that is able to tell you with this kind of precision that there's virtually no electron density between these two places that have a lot of electron density. And uh, all, all, almost all I can say is I'm really thankful for this uh, capability that has been uh, availed to us. Uh, I, I know that not everyone in the world where an electron is, is like makes their day or not, but it's on. Uh, <laughs> and that's good news, actually, that your day doesn't depend upon where the electrons are. But uh, sensors really do depend on, for their activity, on where electrons are. And, and it's great that we're able to do computations of the location of those electrons. Thank you. <laughs> With, uh, the, the systems that are available. So what we've uh, just uh, compared here is a system that has a modification on the central ring and a non-modification on the central ring. And I think you can tell pretty readily that, uh, well, I'd have to define symmetric, right? But uh, that this one is less symmetric in its distribution of electrons. And that can impact how much it can be affected by interacting with another molecule. These uh, next two I might uh, skip through. Uh, this is a project that we just begun to build. Uh, these are cross-shaped molecules that uh, this would have on the order of 140,000 atoms in it. So these aren't really small systems, but I'm uh, told by uh, Dr. Sparrow that uh, they're well within the range of the kind of systems that we can model at Marshall. 
and, and that's wonderful because uh, we would like to see how the miracle happens if they grow, but we're also just interested in what truly is their structure because our microscopes, although they may be good, they cannot tell us exactly what those structures are. So you shouldn't be able to see the cross shapes here, but these are the kind of numbers of these particles that we grow. They're, we're able to see them a little bit better there, maybe a little bit better there. And then this is uh, what uh, one of these origamis in a cross shape would look like. And our value for those is that we hope that we'll get orthogonal arrangements of molecules out of using this kind of cross shape. Whereas all the other images that I showed you before, the molecules are randomly distributed on a surface. And you know, most computers aren't built out of things that are randomly distributed. Uh, we're, we're going towards this non-random distribution. And because I understand that we can work with millions of, millions of atoms, this computational capability will serve us well in the future. I, uh, the Viz Lab's been wonderful, but uh, better almost than the Viz Lab is this ability to do calculations of electronic structure for molecules because that's where the sensing is really going to be for us. I've got a wonderful group that I've had the privilege to work with. I would like to suggest or mention that uh, Jack Smith and Justin Chapman have been very involved in uh, getting us uh, rolling in these projects and I appreciate the support too. And uh, I, I have gotten support from a number of different agencies and state of West Virginia and uh, Marshall University has been very supportive of us. Thank you.